So now that we've talked about the brain and all the different uh, injuries and injury patterns of the brain and, and herniation and intracranial pressure and some of the, the management principles, let's now move on and talk about the spinal column and the spinal cord. And this is a pretty nuanced little area of discussion as well. Okay, so let's just review the uh, basic anatomy. All right. So uh, I showed you guys on the skeleton there, but just let's just review. So each... Um, vertebrae that is unfused, a fused vertebrae of course are going to be a little different, but unfused vertebrae, so the cervical, the thoracic, um, and the lumbar vertebrae have the same general kinds of um, morphology. And that is you have the large thick bony prominence known as the body, all right? And then, and, and so this here is going to be Ventral, right? Ventral or anterior, and this here is going to be dorsal, just to orient you guys, okay? And so I have the body, and then I have the canal or the foramen, and of course the canal is where the spinal cord itself goes through, right? Penetrates down through the canal. And then on the dorsal aspect, you have bone that protects the back, that traverses the back, and that's called the transverse process, right? So it's lateral, and then the process that sticks out directly in line with the dorsal aspect is known as the spinous process. You guys, you guys okay with that? And then you have a disc that sits okay, on top of the body and separates the individual vertebrae, and that's known as an intravertebral disc. You guys cool with that? If we look at it from the side, Right, the um, the 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 individual vertebrae actually articulate at, at joints, so there is movement. Right, your spine does have movement, and those joints are known as facet joints. So you can see there's an example of a facet. You can see the transverse process sticking out at you now because we're looking at the lateral um, view, and you can see internally you've got the four foramen internally, and you can see that the spinal cord is there internally with the dotted line, and then you have this opening here that allows the nerve root to come out, right, and you have that on each side, right, on the right and left lateral aspect, all right, and then here's the disc in between the bodies of those vertebrae, okay, you guys, you guys okay with that, that's a basic um, anatomy all right, um, let's look at the disc real quick. So the intervertebral disc has two general components. You have an outer, tough, fibrous capsule. Okay, so it's, it's tough, it's fibrous, it holds things together. And that's known as the annulus fibrosis. And then you have a thinner, more gelatinous, squishy interior known as the nucleus propulsus. And... A very common injury is where you get a tear of the annulus, and then the nucleus propulsus herniates out through that tear, and that is known as what? That is known as a herniated disc. You guys okay with that? Very common injury, a very common problem. And we'll talk about that here in just a little bit. All right. So remember, the column consists of 33 vertebrae. But the sacral and cosageal vertebrae are fused, so you don't have the classic um, spinal root. It looks more like spaghetti at the, at the bottom of the spinal cord. It kind of branches out in a spaghetti-like appearance. But certainly cervical, thoracic, and lumbar, um, the 7, the 12, and the 5, have this in common as to how the peripheral nervous system exit the central nervous system. All right, you got 7, 12, 5, 5, 4, right? 7, 12, 5, 5, 4. Okay, um, real quickly, let's talk about disc herniation because it is a very common problem, and sometimes it occurs spontaneously as people get older and things degenerate. So disc herniation causes two major problems, general problems. It causes something known as spinal stenosis. And spinal stenosis is a narrowing of the spinal canal. So if you have a herniation that involves a spinal canal, right, so you have some herniated material here, 
that decreases the size of the canal, right? It narrows, and then that begins to put pressure on the spinal nerves, the roots, as they come out. You guys okay with that? And then you can also get something called spondylitis. And spondylitis is inflammation within the canal. So narrowing is spinal stenosis. Inflammation is spondylitis. And together, those two things form the basis of something known as degenerative disc G disease, or DJD. Very common, right? And this stenosis and spondylitis can cause characteristic problems. It can cause pain, right? can cause muscle spasms, and it can cause, particularly if it involves the lumbar discs, it can, it can cause neurological dysfunction of the legs and, in severe cases, of the pelvic cavity, right? And you guys have maybe heard people talk about how they get shooting pain down their leg and into their foot. That's something known as sciatica, right? And that is due to stenosis and spondylitis compromising the the roots that involve the sciatic nerve as they come out of the lumbar spine, typically the lower lumbar spine, like L4, L5 in that area there, right? That's called sciatica. In, in more severe cases, you can actually get motor dysfunction where you're not able to flex your foot normally, and what will happen is the foot will drop, and that's known as foot drop, right? That can happen in severe cases. The most severe presentation of a disc herniation or degenerative disc disease in the lower area of the spine is something known as kina equata syndrome. Have you guys ever heard of that term? Kina equata syndrome. What kina equata syndrome is, is where these patients get numbness of their groin. They generally tend to have an inability to urinate, possibly even defecate. Um, as you might imagine, that that's kind of problematic, right? And kinequata syndrome, um, the compromise, the pressure um, on those nerve roots is so severe that they can become ischemic and they can actually um, die um, and cause permanent neurological dysfunction. Um, and so kinequata syndrome needs to be surgically corrected as uh, considered a surgical emergency. Um, and so if you have somebody, you know, has a history of of deger degenerative disc disease, you know, and, and you see these, these people because they have a lot of chronic pain and, and sometimes they're part of the frequent flyers, right? You're going to them a lot and they're having back pain, you're bringing them, they're having a hard time controlling your pain. Um, and they have these new symptoms, right? They're like, I'm having difficulty urinating, I'm having numbness of the groin. If you have any of those, those are red flags. That is um, a, a medical emergency, a surgical emergency, really. It's a neurosurgical emergency. Um, I've had a friend who is a, a nurse paramedic up in Albuquerque who crashed his motorcycle some years ago and had Connie Quata syndrome, and he had to have emergent uh, decompression of his lumbar or spine. Yeah. Okay. You guys okay with that? All right. So far, so good. All right. Cool. All right. So let's uh, move on, and let's now talk about um, the spinal cord itself. So if I take a cross-section of the spinal cord, and I look at the very center of it, I have a little open canal there. That's known as the central canal, and that's filled with cerebral spinal fluid. And we know that the meninges extend around the spinal cord as well, right? and you have cerebral spinal fluid in the subarachnoid space around the spinal cord as well as within the central canal. So just like the brain, right? The brain has cerebral spinal fluid in the ventricles in the center and in the subarachnoid space around it. Same thing with the spinal cord. Okay, so when we look at the cross-section of the spinal cord, we see two major structures. You have a, an X-like structure here or a kind of a butterfly-like structure near the center of the spinal cord. You guys see that there? And that consists primarily of gray matter. What is gray matter? And this is the same in the brain as it is the spinal cord. Gray matter consists primarily of what? Cell bodies, right? These are the cell bodies. This is where integration of information occurs. And then 
around that you have all this white matter in what primarily is contained within white matter? Axons, myelinated axons, right? So information processing will occur more toward the center of the spinal cord, right? And then the movement of information is going to be more peripheral. Does that make sense? Right? So information going in and out, moving up and down the spinal cord will be more peripheral. And then interneuron processing of information will be more the center. All right? You guys okay with that? Kind of makes sense? So what we can do is we can... And I'm going very basic, very basic. This is, this is not, not nearly scratching the surface of the different tracks that we run into, so we're going to go big picture here. But there are three general areas or columns or tracks, okay? So the dorsal aspect, also known as the posterior, okay, so this is a posterior aspect, and this is ventral or anterior here, okay? So I have a column of white matter here known as the dorsal column, okay? And the dorsal column sends vibrational and proprioception information up to the brain. This is an afferm. So this is sensory, right? You guys okay with that? That's sensory information. And this is ipsilateral sensory information. What does that mean? What does ipsilateral mean? What is ipsilateral? If I have ipsilateral pupil dilation, what, what does that mean? Huh? It, yeah, ipsilateral means same side. Remember how we said that when you have bleeding or pressure or a tumor or mass effect occurring and it puts pressure on the oculomotor nerve, right, the pupil on the side, the same side of that insult will dilate. Ipsilateral is same side, right? So if I have information from the left side of the body, it is going to move up the left dorsal column. Does that make sense? If I have sensory information moving um, in from the right side of the body, it's going to move up the right dorsal column. This is ipsilateral. You guys, you guys okay with that? Ipsilateral. All right. Here on the sides, we have another tract or column, and this is known as the corticospinal tract. So the dorsal column is posterior or dorsal, and this is vibration and proprioception information, okay? The lateral aspect is the corticospinal tract, and this is primarily ipsilateral motor information. So this is motor information moving down the spinal cord out to the body, and it is same-sided. You guys okay with that? Same-sided. All right. And then down here is what's called the spinothalamic tract, all right? And this conveys pain and temperature information, and this is contralateral. So if I have pain and temperature information over here, that information will move up through the corticospinal tract on the opposite side of the spinal cord. Does that make sense? Okay, you guys cool with that? Sort of? All right, cool. So this forms the basis of understanding something known as spinal cord syndromes. All right, and so what's going to happen is when you have a patient with a suspected spinal injury and you're doing your assessment, you should be assessing pain, temperature, vibration of sensations, movement, motor activity, right? Where is it? What's going on? Where is it being lost? And when assessing that, that allows you to determine what area of the spinal cord is injured. 
based on these three primary areas. Now, which of them are in injured? The easiest thing to understand is what we call a complete transection. What is a complete transection? The entire cord is severed or compromised, which means the dorsal column, the cortical spinal tract, and the spinal thalamic tract are all disrupted, which means you have a complete loss of motor and sensory information, right? So this is a classic loss of sensation, classic paralysis that we see, right? Not all spine injuries are complete transections, however, as we're going to talk about. All right. So um, there we go. So this is just to remind you guys how information leaves the spinal roots. You have a root at the back called the dorsal root and a root toward the front called the ventral root, right? And you have got motor information that comes out. So efferent information comes out of the spinal cord and goes through the ventral root to effectors, primarily skeletal muscle. And then sensory information comes in through the dorsal root. All right. You guys okay with that? And then you have the three major tracks. Okay, cool. Let's move on. So let's now talk about the major spinal cord syndromes. I love to have test questions about these. All right. So let's talk about probably one of the most rare syndromes, and this is posterior cord syndrome. So this is where I have injury to the posterior aspect of the spinal cord, but the lateral and anterior aspects of the spinal cord are preserved. So which area is primarily damaged? Right? What is that area known as? What's that? Good. Right? So what happens is your patient that has posterior cord syndrome has bilateral loss of vibration and proprioception, right? Because it's primarily sensory information, right? But they have preserved bowel and bladder sensation. This might be unilateral if it only involves, you know, maybe this side here, right? And is it going to be ipsilateral or contralateral if the posterior involves only one side? Ipsilateral, right? Ipsilateral loss of vibration and proprioception, but you will have preserved pain, temperature, and motors, right? So you can still have movement, you can still sense pain and temperature, but you lose proprioception. What is proprioception? That's knowing where you are in space, right? Where that extremity is or where your body is in space and um, vibration. Um, what tends to cause this? Very specific kinds of things, typically that disrupt the posterior spinal artery. So things like tumors and abscesses tend to cause this, right? If you have surgery, for example, and you develop an abscess in the posterior part um, of the cord that compromises that artery, or you have a, a meningioma, a meningeal tumor that develops, something like that. Not really commonly seen, and, and certainly not as common in, 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 in trauma. Okay, let's move on to the more common things that we see. Anterior cord syndrome tends to be very common. All right, and so this is a this is damage to the anterior aspect of the cord with preservation of the dorsal or posterior aspect. So if I'm damaging the anterior, what am I losing? Good, so I'm losing pain and temperature, right? So I have a loss of pain and temperature, and remember I've got motor pathways there, right? I hit the motor pathways, so I have loss of motor, right? So I have paralysis, I have loss of pain, I have loss of temperature, but I have preservation of proprioception and vibration. These patients can still feel um, waves, vibration, right? And they can still have a sense of where that area is 
in response to, to the environment that it's in, right? They have proprioception. Um, what tends to cause this? Flexion injuries, right? Well, what's an example of a flexion injury? If I hyperflex, what way is the spine moving? Back? Is that flexion? Like this? If I do head tilt, chin lift, what am I doing? Head tilt, chin lift is like this, right? This is known as extension. This is known as flexion, right? And that makes sense, right? You're flexing <laughs> muscles, right? If I'm doing crunches and I'm moving my spine in this way, I'm flexing and then I'm extending, right? So flexion. So hyperflexion like that, all right? And the anterior spinal artery gets compromised, right? What other kinds of things can cause this in addition to trauma, vascular disease, um, aortic cross clamping, right? So trauma patient goes into surgery, they cross clamp the aorta, right? They cut off perfusion to the anterior part of the spine, tumors and abscesses. Okay, you guys go with that? Was it, what kind of injury? Like diving? I don't know. Uh, yes, a diving injury, right? Where you dive in and you experience hyperflexion. Very well may present with anterior cord syndrome. You guys... Kind of makes sense? Cool. All right. Um, the next one is, is even weirder, and this is what's known as brown Saguard syndrome, and this is where you have damage to one side of the spinal cord. So you get even weirder things. Um, brown Saguard syndrome. This is known as a hemisection of the cord, a hemicord or one side, one hemisphere of the cord. Okay. So you will have contralateral loss of pain and temperature. So you'll lose pain and temperature sensation on the opposite side of your body to where the injury is, right? You will have ipsilateral motor loss and ipsilateral vibration in proprioception loss. And what is probably the most common cause of a hemisection? This tends to classically be penetrating trauma, right? Mm -hmm a bullet, a missile, some object, knife sometimes, tends to go through one specific area, right? So you tend to hemisect and damage one area. So penetrating trauma tends to cause this, right? Hyperflexion trauma tends to cause this here. You guys, you guys cool with that? Make sense? All right. Um, all right, moving right along. Another kind of trauma that's fairly common is known as central cord syndrome, where the center part of the spinal cord is damaged, but the peripheral parts are preserved. And this um, produces rather interesting signs as well. And I just remember muddy. Just think of muddy with central cord. Okay. So you have right? Motor loss. You have more motor than sensory loss, okay? Upper extremity motor loss is greater than lower extremity, so you have more upper extremity loss, okay? Distally worse than proximal, okay? And this is always, almost always due to extension injuries, and that's the only injury we haven't talked about yet, right? We've talked about penetrating trauma, we've talked about flexion injuries, and now extension injuries. And this is that classic, you, you fall, maybe hit your chin, and you hyperextend your neck, or you have a very severe whiplash injury with hyperextension, right? You guys okay with that? You have a hyperextension injury, all right? And um, this is very good at um, damaging the center of the cord. And these patients are sometimes referred to as walking paraplegics. What? In the world? Yeah, a walking para. Because remember, we said that the upper extremities are more affected than the lower extremities, right? And so you could potentially have this injury and have an ambulatory patient right? A cervical spine injury. This, these are typically C-spine injuries, and they're ambulatory, 
and they have loss of motor and, and, and some sensory function to their upper extremities, but they're still able to ambulate. Weird. But again, it has to do with what area the spinal cord is injured, right? Um, that that kind of makes sense? Yeah. yeah, so that's why sometimes we call them walking paras, because instead of the lower extremities, right, instead of below the injury being involved, this is an upper extremity problem, right? How With common is that? Relatively common. Really? Relatively I've common. Never seen yeah, that. relatively. Huh? Yeah, it's a yeah, relatively I mean, common. I mean, I, get, I, I see where. Yeah. I never thought about it, but I mean, it, yeah, but I, it's, a, it's weird. It's a relatively common. Yeah, it tends to be extension injuries that cause this. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, fairly, fairly, fairly reasonably common kind, kind of injury pattern. Yeah. It's really bizarre, huh? Yeah. Yeah. And so this is, this is easy to kind of, when you're doing your assessment, like you have somebody in a vehicle, right, and they're in trap or whatever, and you're doing your assessment, hey, can you wiggle your toes? Yeah, yeah, oh, okay, they can wiggle their toes, so everything's okay, right? And, and sometimes I, I would venture to say that sometimes this is not identified readily, right? Because, you, you know, they're moving their toes, and then you just kind of neglect doing a real detailed assessment, right? And, you know, right? I mean, it happens. And so this may be something that doesn't get picked up on, you know, right away. Yeah, because it's not you wouldn't expect that. Hey, if they can move their legs, well, then clearly the injury, you know, is, yeah. you know, it doesn't clearly it won't involve their arms, right? Um, you know, and, you know, you're doing an IV and all that, and you just, you know, you're just doing your thing. Right? So, yeah. but it's a relatively common um, kind of injury. Okay, you guys, you guys, okay with that? Um, I think I've already talked about kind of. I know I've already talked about kind of quadra syndrome. We said that it's it's associated with disc herniation, spinal stenosis, spondylitis, right? Um, if you have bowel and bladder dysfunction, this is uh, sometimes known as uh, conus uh, medullaris syndrome, but it's all kind of equata. It tends to be emergent. Um, they need surgery. They need decompression to preserve um, bowel and bladder um, function. Um, and then... A complete transection, well, we've already talked about that. That's the easiest one to identify, right? That in involves global um, motor and sensory deficits globally. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, and then I'll go back to the um, dry board, and we'll continue talking about spinal injuries, just some other things. Does that kind of make sense, though, the cord syndromes? Um, a little bit, hopefully.